All right, so um, we're uh, uh, talking uh, a little bit about uh, seismic refraction, and this is uh, the second lecture on seismic refraction. We are in um, uh, the Seismic 1 PDF overhead uh, or, or notes, and the um, uh, this is found on uh, on page 28 of the Seismic One PDF. All right. So the um, uh, we've gone through the seismic refraction technique, the very basics of doing the back of the envelope calculation, uh, as you'll do in the lab exercises. Um, and I need to talk now about some complications. Um, you know, these are situations that uh, violate the very very simple assumptions that we've made. To come up with these uh, these simple uh, uh, equations that define uh, the depths, the dip, and all that. So um, you know if if these uh, if our assumptions are are not correct, uh, we might not know that uh, uh, that we're violating them, and we'll go ahead and and calculate depths and dips and all that. And but the results will be erroneous, okay? And um, you know the question is how can you how can you uh, not be an error when you uh, when you do your calculations, okay? How do you know that you're that you're not violating your assumptions, okay? Um, and we'll have to discuss that in detail. Uh, there are several kinds of uh, of complications, okay? There are two kinds of hidden layers, and then uh, two kinds of structural and stratigraphic uh, uh, complications. All right, the hidden layers, um, so-called, are um, uh, hidden zone uh, type one is a low velocity layer, and then uh, hidden zone type two is a thin layer. Okay, a layer that's too thin to produce a uh, uh, a noticeable refraction. There's also um, these structural complications. Uh, there can be changes in uh, in velocity laterally. You know, none of our equations have uh, have adjusted for that. And there can also be faults and offsets. Uh, you know, non-planar um, um, lateral changes in uh, in our refractor structure. Uh, okay. So uh, for the low velocity layer, hidden zone type one. As it's sometimes called, and you'll see that uh, occasionally in uh, in papers, um, we have um, really three layers. Okay, but the uh, the first interface between V1 and V2 does not produce a refraction. Okay, that's because V2 is less than V1. All right, and then. Um, you get uh, further down below the second layer into the, into a third layer, and V three is finally larger, okay, larger than than V one as well as V two. Uh, so here's what the uh, so that's a cross section, okay. Here's what the uh, the time distance plot will look like, okay. You'll see V one, and you'll see one crossover, and you'll see a second velocity, but uh, that's not v2. That's really v3. Okay. Now, if you're lucky and you have really good data, you might see some reflections, and you might notice that uh, the uh, the reflections are not uh, uh, entirely uh, asymptotic to where you think they should be. Okay. So that can be a clue. Um, but uh, essentially, because there's only two slopes in the time distance plot. Uh, you know, you go ahead and you use your equations for two velocities, uh, just as we have above. Uh, the trouble is the waves are spending extra time in the low velocity layer, so the um, the intercept time and the crossover distance as well they're both too large, and you'll get a false depth that is larger than the true depth. Okay, now um, this is. Uh, this is very problematic uh, uh, for some situations and not so problematic for others. You know, if you're getting a, a large, um, uh, you know, if you're ordering up a large enough drilling rig to to drill down to the basement, uh, and you're getting the depth of the basement from uh, refraction experiment, and by the way, this uh, same uh, 
uh, hidden zone, the low velocity layer, you know, all of these problems occur, uh, of course, uh, with reversed uh, um, reverse shots as well as the, uh, uh, you know, you can do everything right. Okay, you get a forward and you get a reverse shot, and you might not see the. Uh, it'll be very hard to see the hidden layer. Okay, and you'll have that the possibility that the depth um, is not as large as what you calculate. Okay, so if you ordered up a drill rig to drill to your false large uh, depth uh, to bedrock, um, well, it means you may have uh, overspecified and spent a little bit too much money, but um, at least uh, you know you will hit the uh, the basement with the drill rig you ordered. So it may end up being a more expensive hole than it had to be, but it'll still be successful. Uh, however, if you're if you're assessing um, Say the thickness of an aquifer and uh, trying to total up a uh, water resource um, by getting the depth to the uh, the bottom of the basin, right? Um, and you get a false depth that's that's too large, all right? Then you're overestimating the resource, and so then when people's wells start going dry later on, that'll be the uh, 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 you know that'll be the problem, okay? Um, this is really an equivalence problem, right? Um, you know, you have a trade-off between how low is that velocity, how much less than v1 is that velocity, versus um, how thick is that is that layer, okay? And you can produce the same, uh, you know, too large uh, ti with either a very thin and very low velocity layer, or well, a thin and very low velocity layer, or a thick and not so low velocity layer. So it's really hard to assess, uh, assess that. What's the solution? For doing this kind of simple refraction work alone, there is no solution. All right? This is the first example of something where you know, we can't get the whole story. We can't assess the whole situation using just one technique. All right? uh, you can get some control if you collect good enough data and enough data Okay, to measure the reflections. All right, that usually takes you know doing a reflection survey, which is generally, as you'll find out in the field, a lot more effort than a refraction survey. Uh, low velocity layers are often low density. Okay, so if you calculate basin depths using uh, using refraction, and then you calculate basin depths using uh, gravity, and you get a mismatch, well, that could be a clue that something is wrong. Okay. Um, also, um, uh, the way we, we often solve this in the Great Basin is that the, uh, the low velocity layer uh, and it's at the top of the low velocity layer is often the top of a uh, tertiary lake bed sequence. And then we have, um, um, you know, which may be, it's full of clay, it's, it, it may be salty, right? So it's, uh, its seismic velocity is low. But uh, of course, refraction can't can't see that. But the um, um, the electrical resistivity, as we'll find out, of of uh, you know saturated salty mud is very is very very low. While the electrical resistivity of um, a uh, um, uh, say a freshwater filled alluvium, you know, which is producing V one, right? We have alluvium over lake bed, and then you know, say granite bedrock down below that. Okay, that's a pretty typical basin section in uh, uh, in the Western Great Basin. Okay, uh, so while refraction is unable to find the uh, alluvium to lake bed transition, um, an electrical or electromagnetic survey finds it easily. All right, uh, even if it's uh, at fairly substantial depth. Uh, that. Um, Conductive uh, lake bed is uh, pretty easy for an electrical or electromagnetic survey to spot. So that's uh, a very typical way of solving the problem here in uh, in Nevada. Um, and of course, if you got control from boreholes and and you can see the uh, the low velocity layer, you know, with a sudden jump in the in the clay content in the chips, well, that's uh, uh, you know the best way to verify it. All right, hidden zone type two, the thin layer. Um, basically, uh, 
we, we, we have the situation we want where v1 is less than v2, which is, uh, and they're both less than v3. But the problem is that v3 is, is too high, okay? And v2 is not high enough relative to v1, or it's also typically very thin. So what happens is you get the v1 line here in the, in the record section, okay? And uh, the uh, v2 line, yeah, it's, it's steeper, and uh, we should see it. But um, the, uh, the v3 line is so fast that it comes out uh, and makes its crossover with the v1 line before the v2 line ever has a chance to get there. All right, so we still just see two slopes. All right, big problem. So um, uh, essentially, the uh, uh, the Ti one, you know, is uh, is too close to Ti two, and um, so the V three can take over before we ever see V two. So basically, you know, looking at our first arrivals, we have no way of measuring. Um, we'd be very lucky to be able to see V two, you know, in the data after the V three arrival. So usually we just don't have any way of measuring it. Okay. Uh, now the waves travel faster uh, uh, than v1 in the layer. So what happens is that the ti2 is too is 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 too small. Okay. Give for our assumption of you know not not v having no v1. I'm sorry, having no v2, having no uh, second velocity, just having v1 and v3. That's going to be what we think we observe, right? So our Ti2 is going to be too small for that, and so we'll get a false depth for the V3 refractor, which we think is V2, and that depth is going to be smaller than the real depth. So you know, if we have hidden layer uh, type 1, the low velocity layer, we get a maximum depth. If we have hidden layer type 2, we get a, uh, the, the thin layer inter of intermediate velocity, we get a minimum depth, all right? so. Uh, you know these two don't uh, don't really help us constrain it either, uh, and again there's no solution for refraction alone. Now if we have any ideas about the velocity between v1 and v2, I mean maybe in a different part of the basin we saw that layer, okay, and uh, we got a measurement off it somewhere, okay. Uh, we can put that slope at the first arrivals at the uh, at the crossover. You know we can we can bring that slope up to here. We can make a calculation of depth. And that'll give us a, a maximum depth. Okay, so um, uh, that's one way to uh, uh, to try to assess that. So uh, the situation is very common. All right, uh, and uh, if we know the stratigraphy, if we do some drilling, or if we have uh, reflections, you know, then we have some chance of controlling it. Um, and uh, that's uh, uh, that's probably the the best hope. Okay, other uh, other kinds of uh, complications, you know, that are violating our um, our simple assumptions. All right. Now um, there are lateral changes in velocity, lateral changes in uh, in refractor structure. Okay, and all of those are going to prevent our uh, our time picks from following perfectly straight lines. I mean, we're going to have some uncertainty in our in every time pick. And that's going to interfere with uh, making perfectly straight lines, and we're going to have uh, also some real changes in in velocity, real changes in structure, you know, not uh, uh, perfectly planar dipping uh, layers uh, that are also going to uh, appear as uh, um, as disturbances in our uh, in our first arrival time picks. So uh, what often happens is you do your here. This is a, a time distance plot, and we've got uh, you know say the forward shot on the left and the reverse shot on the right, and so we have v1 and v2 from the forward shot, v1 and v2 from the reverse shot. You know with their differences in intercept time and their differences in the apparent v2 velocities, right? Um, but we'll see that over some range of geophones, which is almost the same from you know from the forward and reverse uh, data, um, they're kind of uniformly delayed. Okay, they're delayed by the same delta t, the same change in time uh, 
uh, you know, they sit back here instead of up here where they should be. All right? You know, we sort of see the uh, the line die out and move back to a larger time, and then it jumps back up to uh, where it was. All right. So those delayed arrivals, you know, that are later relative to the straight lines, um, are a good clue that there's a uh, some kind of lateral change. All right. So the uh, uh, now we we don't just have to have delay. We can also have advances. You know. Uh, the the arrival can appear out in front of the of the overall straight line, that would be called an advance. It's just a negative delay. Advances are delays that occur at the same geophones for both the forward and reverse shots, with about the same amount are likely from a lateral change that's directly under the delayed geophones. Okay, so um, you know if if it's coming more from the the depth of the refractor and if it's fairly deep, okay, then the, that will shift the delays in forward and reverse away from each other. Okay, they'll move away from the uh, uh, the the delayed parts will move to larger distances, and so they'll separate. You know, the uh, this reverse one would move uh, toward the left, the forward one would move to the right, and they'll kind of separate each other uh, in here. So there's a basic ambiguity. Okay, we observe a, a delay. And we want to see, all right, what would happen if we uh, if we interpret this delay as structure as some kind of offset in depth of the refractor, okay? Or we could interpret it as some kind of velocity change, you know. So we could have, um, you know, our our same v1 over v2, you know, just as we've seen everywhere else, all right, in these two cross sections here, and our flat reflector is maybe interrupted by a grobin here. And that graben, um, you know, is, has a depth h, or you know, let's say there's these 90 degree dip slip faults on the on the side of it, and uh, and they both and and these faults have uh, offset h, you know, which is some you know fairly substantial portion of the uh, thickness of v1, all right, and so the refraction having to come up from the bottom of the grob, but instead of just the uh, the usual refractor depth, is going to take more time in the slower stuff in V1, and that'll cause a delay. However, you can cause exactly the same delay by inserting a, a wedge of lower velocity material, call it V0, instead of V1. Okay, so we get this brick of uh, low velocity material in here, and you know, we leave the refractor as perfectly flat, okay, or perfectly straight at least, and the extra time can be explained by the the waves having to come up through this lower velocity v zero instead of v one, okay. Both situations actually can produce the same data, the same exact same delays in the exact same configuration is uh, is possible, okay. Uh, and often we we have to conclude, yeah, there's a bit of both operating here, um, but at least let's uh, uh, let's uh, take a look at, uh, uh, at at how we can interpret these uh, you know these two alternatives, and then you know as usual, reality is going to be somewhere in between. All right, uh, just a, a note about the sign of the delays. Okay, the delay delta t. If it's delayed, it's a positive delta t. If it's advanced, it's a negative delta t. Okay, that's going to a negative delay. That's going to make a difference in these uh, equations we're going to use. So to analyze a delay, you've got to assume uh, uh, structure or velocity. You know, or you know, if you've got some corroborating data, you know, some depths to uh, from wells, say, to uh, the refract the the refracting surface, um, then uh, you can try. Uh, uh, to make a combination, but uh, it's good to assess the end member possibilities, right? So we'll assume all structure and see what we get, and we'll also assume all velocity and see what we get. Okay. Uh, one way to try to separate that and assess which it is, you know, structure and refractors like that grobin in the in the bedrock interface. I mean that that's going to have a potential field signature that'll that'll have a uh, uh, a magnetic signature that'll have a gravity signature. You know, would lead to a gravity low, and uh, you can see the size of the grobin in the uh, in the gravity. So um, 
that's uh, one way to do it, uh, to look at it. Okay, going to other techniques, right? Refraction is not defining everything we want to know. Um, near surface velocity changes could be associated with with resistivity variations. You know, often if you go to um, to clay, uh, you know, from sand to clay, or from uh, say uh, uh, sandy gravelly alluvium to to uh, more clay, then you'll have um, not only lower velocity, you also have lower resistivity. Okay, and if those if those uh, resistivity variations are near the surface, they could be pretty easy to detect. So you can get a definitive answer by uh, putting your source in the delay area to see if v1 really changes there. Okay, and measure a v1 you know right in the middle of the of the area. And if you don't, uh, if v1 is the same in the in the area of the delay. Then you know that uh, it's got to be structure or or deeper velocity at least, and that's actually the secret behind uh, uh, Optum's uh, size opt at two D techniques uh, that you'll uh, uh, have uh, run on on your own picks from our our lab data set for uh, refraction. Okay, you you get enough sources uh, in in enough of the area, and uh, you can you can actually you know. Nail down these uh, the source of these variations. All right. So if you take the structural assumption, you compute a deflection, uh, which we'll call H. You know, maybe it's a vertical fault throw even. Uh, that's it's a deflection in the refractor. Okay. So for uh, of course simplest to show here for zero dip in the refractor. Okay. You know, for more complicated situations, we leave that up to the size opt uh, uh, software. Okay, so h is going to be equal to uh, delta t times the cosine of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, critical angle, okay, theta sub c, divided by the quantity uh, one over v one minus one over v two. Okay, so that will uh, give you a measure of the uh, of the structural deflection. Okay, uh, and as you can see, the larger the delta t. The larger the structural deflection. All right. With the velocity assumption, okay, uh, if it's all velocity, then uh, what you want to do is compute a uh, that that v zero. All right. And so here again, we'll um, you know we're adding uh, delays here. Right. So one over the different v zero is going to be, and, and you know in both these cases, uh, delta t can be positive or negative. Right, a negative h would just be a um, it would be a, a horse on the on the uh, um, on the refractor, right? Just like a positive h uh, is a graben. Okay, uh, so um, one over v zero is equal to delta t times cosine of the uh, of the critical angle divided by uh, the average dip to the refractor. Okay, z one. Plus one over v one. All right. Again, this is for for zero dip. Okay, and you got to know v one and v two, which you've gotten from your standard analysis. Okay, your back of the envelope calculation, and this will give you the uh, uh, the new velocity. And again, if uh, if you have an advance, then v zero is going to be higher than v one. If it's a delay. Uh, and delta t is positive, then uh, v zero will be less than v one. Okay. So um, uh, let me review uh, uh, before we just before we finish up on seismic refraction. Um, let me let me review some of the basic uh, concepts. All right. We're getting uh, we're using size, the seismic refraction technique to measure velocities. And to get the depths to structures that are acting as refractors, and these can be important structures uh, such as uh, you know the bottoms of basins or uh, the tops of uh, uh, things like the water table and uh, uh, the tops of, uh, of volcanic uh, flows, for instance, uh, or the uh, the base of the soil uh, where we would have to uh, you know say drive piles for two for a foundation. All right, so uh, refraction is very well used in uh, foundation engineering, very well, very much used in water resources.
Okay, so we uh, do a forward and reverse shot. We pick uh, first arrival times. We measure the apparent velocities, uh, the, the, the V1s, and average them. We, we see the apparent V2s. Uh, we, we compute the true V2. We compute the, the dip and the depths. Um, we need the reversal to constrain the dip. And um, we can usually get a result uh, for depths that are uh, you know, one third to one sixth of the, uh, of the maximum offset. Okay, the maximum distance to put between sources and receivers, or or the line length, if you like, if you like. Okay, and we'll we'll actually do all that. All right, the complications in this uh, simple technique using these the simple equations. Uh, we have a low velocity layer, and we've got to have we get that gives us uh, that means that the the two layer uh, depth we calculate is really a, a maximum depth. It's a z max. Um, and uh, we have to resolve it using reflection ana analysis or gravity or electromagnetics. There's the thin layer problem, uh, which can only be solved by uh, uh, reflection, of course, or drilling. Uh, and we're getting uh, um, we're getting z min in that case. You know, we we these complications uh, mean that that we're doing our two layer. Uh, um, our two-layer interpretation, because that's all we know, um, that's all we can see, and uh, in this case, for the thin layer case, that means we're getting a z min, a, a depth that's too small. Okay, uh, so what do we do? You know, um, and if we have some guess of v two, you know, we can get a z max from that. So that that can help a little bit. Then there's the uh, possibility of lateral changes, the structure and velocity ambiguity. Okay. Uh, you put in more shots. You can do reflection. That can help. And and actually, with more shots, that leads to the optimization method that we use in in lab, the uh, size opt, um, the size opt at two uh, uh, D uh, commercial software that uh, you'll get to see the the results of. And uh, so why you know why bother doing the um, the um, you know we have a commercial software that. Uh, Will uh, you know compute a whole section for us and show us all the refractors and all the velocity changes and all the deflections in the refractors? You know what do what do we need? What do we need these equations for? Well, um, what what you're going to find out is that uh, you know very quickly you know with some um, you know in the space of what we can do in a two hour lab, I can teach you to make a, an initial interpretation, um, and you'll see that that's going to match a, a a fair amount. With the uh, the final analysis uh, in the in the optimization, in the commercial software, and that's a so that's a really valuable thing uh, to be able to do some simple analysis and get some insight about your um, your situation, your model, your cross section, you know, before you you look at the full and uh, detailed results, you know that that uh, uh, might be uh, more confusing. It's good to be able to understand them. From some very simple principles, okay. Uh, now there are uh, some other ways of dealing with irregular refractors, and one that's still uh, quite popular is the uh, called the GRM generalized reciprocal method, um, and this is related to a concept called uh, tomography. Um, there's seismic tomography, which is very popular for uh, imaging the crust and and the whole rest of the Earth, um, but really. Uh, uh, Size up to two D is is also a kind of tomography, and that's uh, uh, got a lock nowadays on the engineering market uh, for foundation engineers. So uh, and people who you know who need to excavate or dig trenches. Um, so uh, uh, everything you need to do in the engineering world, uh, uh, you want to do with uh, optimization. And uh, but then if you go into more academic endeavors. Using what's essentially the refraction technique over, uh, you know, say the whole crustal scale, um, then you'll you'll probably call that tomography. Okay, so um, uh, just one final note I wanted to add here on uh, seismic refraction. Uh, uh, we're going to have a uh, uh, another. The next lecture is going to be about uh, seismic surf surface wave analysis, refraction microtremor. Uh, the technique I invented about uh, 
15 years ago. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go into seismic reflection, which is uh, you know, further down in the notes here. Um, but um, one final thing about refraction is uh, uh, if um, your shots and receivers are not all at the same level, uh, and, and you're not using optimization, and you, you know, let's say you want to use these uh, civil back of the envelope calculations, you can actually do a, a time correction, apply a, another kind of delta t, all right, and that will actually uh, even out your um, um, that'll actually even out your uh, um, uh, your your lines and uh, uh, and and make your your data hopefully interpretable by these uh, simple techniques. So you know if you have a source or a receiver that's up on a hill, you know say above your datum. Uh, or above the average elevation of your sources and receivers, then you know the refractions are going to take extra time to get up to the top of that hill. Okay, so that adds a positive delay, a, a positive delta t, because it's got, a, it's got a positive elevation difference, a positive zs. Okay, for a source uh, um, height. Uh, whereas if you're, uh, let's say, this receiver is down here in a valley. Okay. It's going to take less time for the refraction to come up to the uh, this this deeper uh, receiver. So uh, it's at a it's below the datum. It's at uh, minus zg for uh, uh, geophone uh, elevation, and um, and uh, it'll take uh, less time. Okay, so you want to. This is an equation here, uh, and I don't know where these markings came from, but this equation is delta t. Okay. And you, it gives you a time correction, this delta t that uh, you want to subtract from the geophone's time. Okay, so uh, you take the uh, uh, the the datum uh, difference of the source, the datum difference of the receiver, right? And if they're below the datum, then they're negative, right? So you add zs to zg, and um, and then you multiply that by the square root of v squared, v two squared minus v one squared divided by v2 divided by v1 and that um, uh, that effectively gives you a, an elevation correction and once you apply that to your travel times uh, your pick travel times then you may uh, they make more sense they might make more sense if you've got a lot of topography in your survey um, this is a, a pretty approximate method and uh, you know the size opt at 2d really you know uh, handles that correctly